Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video, I'm going to react to the SR-72, the son of the Blackbird. Now, I have been waiting eagerly for some information about if there's going to be a successor to the SR-71 Blackbird because for me, it would be such a waste if that platform, that technology wasn't built into something else if it wasn't iterated upon because you know i still i think it's still the world's fastest either the world's fastest um manned aircraft ever i think it's, you know why abandon that so i'm hoping this video is going to actually show a, a prototype whether it's you know in whether they're just in talks about making a prototype or whether they're well into the prototyping process i'm hoping i see something really cool so let's do it All right. In late 1964, an aircraft took off for the first time that revolutionized aviation. It was sleek, sophisticated, technologically cutting edge, and looked more like something that might appear out of Bruce Wayne's Batcave than a <laughs> traditional aircraft. It was, of course, the incredible. It's 1964, and it still looks more modern, I'd say, than the vast majority of fighter, fighter jets today. It's insane. SR-71 Blackbird The SR-71 was an aircraft that set a new benchmark and one that served the United States Air Force faithfully for almost 35 years. During its lifespan, it was the world's firstest and highest flying air-breathing operational manned aircraft with a fastest recorded speed of 3,529.6 km hour, that's 2,193 miles Insane. per hour. And its highest recorded altitude was about 26,000 meters, that's about 85,000 feet, which is roughly halfway up to where the Earth's strata begins. It goes without saying that the SR-71 was an absolutely astonishing aircraft. But just wait and see what comes next. I heard that they had to secretly get the titanium out of Russia to build it. <laughs> The SR-72, the son of Blackbird, is now inching ever closer to its grand appearance, though nice. it's still perhaps a decade until it enters full service. Solid information regarding this new aircraft is sadly scant at this point, as almost all of it is still classified and under development. But we do have enough to piece together a somewhat clear picture of what the SR-72 might look like. An aircraft which, if the rumored speeds are anything to go by, should be able to reach anywhere on the planet in an hour or less. Crazy. When the SR-71 took its final bow in 1999, it did so without a direct successor in place. While other aircraft could cover some of its roles, it was clear that there was a coverage gap between surveillance satellites, manned aircraft, and unmanned aerial vehicles for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR, as well as strike missions. Let's just quickly jump back and see what kind of aircraft the SR-71 was to better understand what might come next. The SR-71 was a long-range, high-altitude Mach 3 strategic reconnaissance aircraft which first flew in to me it just blows my mind that they were able to build this so long ago because yes it, it started its service in the 60s 64 but that means they must have been designing this in the 50s this was before CAD you know computer-aided design this was before you know supercomputers so they probably used like you know slide rules and and compasses and things like that you know, to, to design something that still today hasn't been beat in terms of speed. Really impressive. 1966, before being retired in 1999. That was actually its second retirement, the first of which came in 1990, but because of how things were in the Middle East and North Korea, the old boys were rolled out for another decade. The aircraft was almost exclusively used for high altitude reconnaissance, and most of its service history is shrouded in secrecy. Pilots who flew the aircraft have spoken of missions averaging three to four hours, though on several occasions that reached well over 11 hours. Wow. SR 71s were famous used during the Yom Kippur War in 1970. 11 hours, but that means they must have just been cruising at that for that duration, because if they went full speed, they'd burn f through their fuel, wouldn't they? Unless it had, did it have air-to-air refueling capabilities? 
1953 between Israel and its Arab neighbors. President Nixon was eager to see whether Israeli and Arab forces had pulled back to where they said they had, so he ordered several blackbirds to take a look. The SR-71s departed the east coast of the United States and delivered the damning photographic evidence directly back to Nixon. Neither the Israelis nor the Arab forces were where they said they were. Nixon called all of the countries directly to announce his inside knowledge, and shortly after, forces from both sides slunk back to where they were supposed to be, <laughs> and the war came to a close shortly after that. During its operational history, an estimated 800 missiles were fired at various SR-71s, all of which missed. That's not to say that it didn't experience all its fair of share of miss. accidents, especially during developments, but in terms of getting in and out of enemy territory quickly and efficiently, it was unparalleled. When the end came for the SR-71 for the second time in 1999, it was a little unclear what came next. The increased use of satellites and drone technology left some questioning whether the US would ever again need a high-altitude, high-speed reconnaissance aircraft in quite the same way. But how things can change. The rise of anti-satellite weapons, anti-access, aerial denial tactics, and counter-stealth technologies have meant that the idea of a roaring aircraft flying at the edge of space that could quickly penetrate enemy territory has gone back into fashion. That's the thing, you know, the, like geopolitics is such a fluid thing that's changing every second that needs, you know, like militarily can change like that. Reports began creeping out in 2007 about a possible successor to the SR-71, and one which would be at least twice as fast, reaching speeds of more than six times the speed of sound. But it wasn't until 2013 that things appeared to be confirmed when Lockheed Martin official Robert Weiss publicly stated that the company was developing a hypersonic plane which he referred to as the SR-72. The company also released concept art depicting an aircraft that looked more like a spacecraft than a plane. The aircraft is currently being developed at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works division a semi-secretive department responsible for many of the most astonishing aircraft that have ever appeared over the last 70 years. I've actually got a video all about that on this channel, but this would be quite a step even to them. The aircraft is thought to be roughly the same size as an SR-71, measuring around 30 meters in length, and I'll just note here that I've seen an SR-71 in real life, and I had images of it in my mind. It's massive. It's way... Yeah, it's weird. Like, I imagine it to be quite a small, sleek thing, but I bet it's massive. Bigger than you think. The major difference, however, will be that the SR-72 will be unmanned, whereas its older brother oh, came with a crew of two. The other major difference is that unmanned. the SR-72 won't simply be the eyes in the sky, it will also have a strike role, most likely using the latest hypersonic missile technology. So it's almost going to be a cross between an SR-71 and a B-2. It's thought that the SR-72 will be powered by two engines, the first of which, a turbine engine, will power the aircraft until it reaches a speed of between Mach 2 and Mach 3. That's between 2,469 and 3,704 kilometers per hour, while the second, a dual-mode ramjet, will provide power for the aircraft's hypersonic speeds. After the excitement of the announcement, there followed a lull of information regarding the SR-72, with some questioning whether the technology to push a plane to Mach 6 even really existed. The biggest obstacle seemed to be the overlap between the two engines. A typical turbojet engine has a That and the materials, because, you know, are there materials that won't melt going that quickly? A top speed of around Mach 2.2, while the scramjet engine has a lowest possible operating speed of roughly Mach 4. So as you can see, there is a considerable gap between the two. In 2014, things took a bit of a twist when NASA became involved with the project and awarded Lockheed Martin an $892,000 contract to study the possibility of using a turbine-based combined cycle TBCC propulsion system which combines both the turbojet engine and the ramjet engine. You know something is like super cutting edge when NASA gets involved, you know? <laughs> The turbojet was first envisioned by a Frenchman by the name of Maxime Guillemot in 1921, though his design was never actually built. The Heinkel HE-178 was the first aircraft to use the technology in 1939, and it's fair to say that we haven't looked back since. The turbojet is an air-breathing jet engine and comes with a gas turbine and a propelling nozzle. Inside the turbine is a compressor and combustion chamber, and it is when the compressed air from the compressor is heated with the help of the burning fuel in the combustion chamber that it expands throughout the turbine. 
turbine. Ah. The exhaust pulls the propelling nozzle and is forced out of the back, providing the aircraft with its thrust. Yeah. Most engines we see today use technology similar to this, but as we've seen with this type of engine, it does come with a speed limit. One option is to include an afterburner, which is often seen in the most modern military aircraft. This is an additional combustion chamber added to the turbine, which can dramatically- But an afterburner, doesn't that, that's not good for visibility and stealth, is it? increase speed, but typically uses around four times the amount of fuel that a non-afterburner mode uses. Now, before we jump straight to a scramjet, it makes sense to start with his little brother, the ramjet. While you might think that the ramjet, with its significantly higher speeds, is a modern invention, well, think again. The concept actually dates back to 1913 and another French inventor, René Laurent, although it would be some time before a working model emerged. The ramjet uses forward motion to compress incoming air without the aid of compressors. For this reason, ramjets cannot operate from a standing start, and vehicles that I use see. it often have needed assisted takeoff. Sometimes this even involves a rocket assist, which is essentially a rocket strapped to the aircraft that powers it up to a high speed, at which point the ramjet can take, take over. over. These types of engines work best at supersonic speeds around Mach 3 and can go all the way up to Mach 6. The scramjet is the upgrade of a ramjet. While they share many similarities, the major difference is that the scramjet involves combustion that takes place in supersonic airflow. A ramjet slightly decelerates the air to subsonic speed before combustion, whereas with a scramjet, the entire process is carried out at supersonic speeds. The result of all that is extraordinary speed. This kind of technology is still being developed, but the theoretical speeds that are involved are mind-blowing. It's thought that scramjets may eventually- No wonder it's an unmanned craft. I just don't think it's possible for a human body to, to not only stay functional and alive, but to, you know, take, like, control the plane going that fast. I don't know if it's possible. Maybe it is. But I don't think so, though. ...actually be able to operate between Mach 12 and Mach 24. Whoa! Just to give you an idea, that's 25,000 kilometers an hour, or 16,000 miles per hour. But as I said, this technology is still very much in its infancy, and it's very likely we have some way to go before we see speeds like that. All right, so let's get back to the SR-72. As I mentioned, there were a few years when very little, if anything, was known about the development of this aircraft. But in 2017 and 2018, a series of tantalizing announcements was made that pointed to some significant breakthroughs. At the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics annual SciTech Forum in 2018, Lockheed Vice President Jack Banian appeared to suggest that through major advances in 3D printing and computer modeling, great strides had been made with the SR-72. His presentation came with a new artist's rendering of the aircraft, while he went on to add, without the digital transformation, the aircraft you see there could not have been made. In fact, five years ago, it could not have been made. Wow, so it's a very, very recent jump in technical ability. He went on to add that they could now digitally print the engine with an incredibly sophisticated cooling system integrated into the material of the engine itself. As you can imagine, his words were light on arrival dates or even how far along the project is, but he seemed to suggest that a prototype or concept demonstrator already exists. Lockheed mm. carefully skirted the issue after the speech by its vice president, neither denying nor confirming any progress made on the SR-72. So it does seem like we're actually quite far along in the project. You know, like, if there's a prototype, surely you're just waiting for approval or a contract being granted by the government and then you can just go into full production, can't you? It's very possible that some kind of prototype of the SR-72 already exists. The internet is awash with images of aircraft that may or may not be the son of Blackbird. Lockheed has stated that they aim to have a concept demonstrator in the air sometime by the mid-2020s, with a service arrival date now tentatively set for 2030. So, I'm afraid we're gonna have to wait a while for this one. Mm. Those in the aviation industry are clear on just what a massive leap forward this would potentially be, but also what enormous obstacles lie ahead. In 2016, the former CEO of Lockheed Martin, Marilyn Houston, suggested that it could be built for less than a billion dollars. The fact that she chose that massive number to work with tells us just- Hold on, a billion per aircraft? <sighs> 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 just how dramatically expensive this project is going to be. 
Then there's the question of weaponry. Lockheed has said that the aircraft will be able to use hypersonic missiles, most likely Lockheed Martin's high-speed strike weapon, which is itself still in development with a rumored speed of Mach 5. The combination of an aircraft traveling well over six times the speed of sound and a missile traveling five times faster than sound is certainly a scary prospect. The final point is how they will be controlled. We already know that the SR-72 will almost certainly not be manned, which leaves the question of whether they will be remotely controlled like many drones or, and this is really taking a leap into the unknown, will it utilize some sort of AI technology that controls some? That's, an, that's a great question, man. I think even in, even in 2030, I, I would think that we're a bit too early to be putting AI in control of such a deadly weapon. You know, if there's any kind of malfunction, any kind of error in the code, huge consequences potentially or all of the aircraft. Unfortunately, we know painfully little about the SR-72 outside of some mouth-watering comments made by Lockheed and some sci-fi looking drawings. If this aircraft is really going to be capable of what we think it will be, this could be one of the most significant steps forward in aviation history. But don't hold your breath just yet. <laughs> so I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash very that interesting. like button. Very, very interesting indeed. A lot of really interesting philosophical questions, you know. Are we ready to trust AI with, you know, weaponry? Like, as far as I'm aware, drones are um, uh, remotely controlled. Uh, to be honest, even if some weren't, even if some were, you know, controlled by some kind of, you know, a specific AI system, we wouldn't even know, would we? Like, let me know in the comments if any of you have that information. But I just don't know if, if we're ready to, to trust, you know, these weapons with with computer programs and algorithms it's just it would be a huge leap in terms of you know it'd be a huge change in terms of in like military weaponry and technology really really interesting though i hope that we see a prototype for the sr-72 before 2030 because man i can't wait to see it thanks for watching guys and i'll see you in the next one